Nice to see you. It's the second time I've been to Suyan's house, I think. Yeah. Second time. So yes, as Brother Tia was saying, uh, Ajahn Pavaru and I just also want to see the faces of people who've been making contributions to helping us build a monastery the last couple of years. So it seems to be going fairly well. And we just want to express our appreciation and our mudita for these uh, groups. May I ask how many people have a, a daily chanting practice? Okay. And a daily meditation practice? About half, okay. Good. Did anybody come to last night's talk at SJBA? So about half. I think I'll talk about Dana Sila Bhavana. Actually, Ajahn, I wanted to ask uh, what would be a good daily uh, practice for cultivation. I'm going to answer your question. I'll talk a little bit about Dana Sila Bhavana and then I'll talk about how to, how to develop it. So, we've all heard probably by now many talks about Dana Sila and Bhavana, but different practitioners have different ways of articulating it, expressing it, describing it. And actually, it sounds quite basic, but the more we practice, Eightfold Path is abbreviated as Dana Sila Bhavana and uh, in its condensed form. So, as we practice these things, our understanding of how to deepen our practice of dana, refine our practice of dana, and similarly with the sila, how to practice sila and how refining our practice of sila supports the development of insight. It's very profound. It's simple, but it's also profound. It's deepening. So, with our dana practice, we approach it and we understand it from a few different angles. So firstly, on a, on a basic level, we un if we believe in karma, and most of us here would, so we all understand that if we give, then that we will have uh, good karma, and our offerings will manifest as good things coming back into our own lives. So we understand dana on the level of doing good, one receives good. So that's true. It's an important aspect of dana, which it also helps us to understand that nothing is lost. So you don't need to feel frightened about giving. When one gives, one will be receiving. That's how the various abundance, whatever abundance you have in your life, it's actually conditioned from having given in the past. On another level, the dana is playing there's many aspects to this dana. It's a very profound practice. And so the Buddha said, if you knew what he knew about dana, you wouldn't eat a single meal without sharing some of it. So that's Lord Buddha saying, dana has such profoundly good consequences for us that we should do it a lot in, in many ways. So another thing that dana is doing on a spiritual level is it's helping us to let go of our tendency to grasp and to hoard and it goes against a tendency towards being stingy. So we have Bharamis, which are virtuous, utterly wholesome mind states or qualities. But then you have the Kilesa, so that's like the, the darker qualities. So the mind is always experiencing different mind states. So some of those mind states are wholesome, some of them are neutral some of them are unwholesome. So the dana, if one does it with joy, delighting in relinquishing, is very, very radiant and wholesome mind state. And it is also weakening the latent tendency in the mind to be stingy. And it's weakening the three root kinesis, greed, hatred and delusion. So it's weakening greed. So greed is based on craving for pleasant feelings, usually sensual feelings pleasant tastes, pleasant sights, pleasant physical feelings, pleasant sounds, that kind of thing. When we train ourselves in developing, it's like developing an appetite, training ourselves to appreciate mental happiness, which is more subtle and more profound and ultimately much better if we really begin to explore the capacity for the mind to experience 
uh, joy, bliss, peace, serenity, beautiful mental qualities. So if we practice dana with right view, we understand that in the act of giving I can only benefit. So those who really believe that, when they give, they're feeling joyful in that moment. So the act of giving is a joyful experience. It's also beginning to destroy kilesa. So this is very profound. And this is actually what we have to do. We have to chip away at, in the beginning, and weaken, and ultimately we have to starve greed in all of its forms. And then it's possible to be someone who has no greed at all. But it, that has to be rooted out, and that's a process. So this dana, joyful, when we practice it with right view, bringing future good results, but also fundamentally central to the path of practice that we're aiming for, for realizing freedom from greed, hatred, and suffering, or realizing the ultimate nature of the mind. So in that weakening of the tendency towards being covetous, grasping, and also to being stingy, not sharing, when we weaken these dark qualities, they become like thinner in the mind. Their influence in the mind wanes. And the joyful uh, capacity to relinquish, which is radiant, begins to shine in the mind. So the mind's becoming a brighter place and the darkness is weakening. This is also, in terms of the bhavana, I'll keep referring to how these kind of basic fundamental principles also affect our practice. So this giving this capacity to relinquish, the capacity to let go. This is something profoundly important in bhavana, in citta bhavana, because Lumpur Cha says very often in his teachings, the most important thing in spiritual practice is learning how to let go. So what he's talking about is letting go of things like reactivity, letting go of fixed opinions, letting go of preferences, and then letting go even of the belief that one knows best or one understands. As you develop your meditation, you have to be able to put most things down. See thoughts as thoughts, put them down. See opinions as opinions, put them down. See moods as just moods, aramana. Mind states as just mind states, not grasp, put them down. So we're talking about dana and how to train in dana and how that training in dana deepens our bhavana. So we've all had experiences in meditation when there's like a heavy or a dark or a miserable kind of a mind state or an unskillful reaction and we've all had that experience of knowing it's unskillful, not wanting to have the reaction and wanting to let it go. And often we can't. There isn't the samadhi or there isn't the it just isn't the spiritual muscle to actually throw that mind state out of the mind. But when you practice dana, you're practicing this capacity to relinquish and to let go. It actually has a direct relationship with that capacity to put down mind states as well. Because it's working on this tendency to grasp. And so when we train ourselves to not grasp as much and to share what we have and to give things away, even the things that we like, then we're learning how to relax the grasping and put things down. So it's really good to be confident about the fact that your practice of dana is uh, good on many levels. And the more you do it, the more benefit you will derive. So it's chipping away, as I was saying, that latent tendencies, the negative dark qualities. So when you chip away at those things, you're... The, the mind is becoming purified and what the result will eventually be is a purified mind. So when we wholeheartedly embrace our dana, I'm just talking about dana and mirroring back the wonderfulness of dana because so many of you are practicing it already. So I'd like you to feel really confident and really happy about the dana that you do and uh, the wonderful results that it will be bringing on many levels. Let's talk a little about sila now. For most people, when we begin to train in the five precepts in a strict way, it's difficult. Certainly it was for me. When I was a young man beginning my Buddhist practice, I was 22. And I came to Buddhist practice by doing a 10-day meditation retreat. That's how I began my practice. So I began with 11 or 12 hours of meditation a day for 10 days. And I had a quite... A good experience on the seventh day which gave me a lot of confidence and faith in in bhavana 
in meditation. But I had right from the beginning, as a 22-year-old in Sydney, a kind of a sense of, I'm not sure about this sealer business. I'm confident that the mind has the potential to experience radiant mind states and to be peaceful. But I'm not sure about those five rules. I think lying to the government is okay. And stealing from your boss a little bit is probably okay. And uh, so in Australia, it's not a Buddhist culture and it's not even really a Christian culture. It's, uh, there is an ethical standard. There is a sense for a fair go that you should be decent and you should give other people a fair go. But there isn't a refined sense of training in virtue that's not at all a part of what I grew up in. So I wasn't at all convinced that one should be impeccable with regards not stealing and not lying. And also with sex, there's probably that general uh, sense that if they want to do it and you want to do it, what's wrong? So it was through a lot of meditation that one as we all do, experiences a clearer mind. And then you realize that actually what you have is a belief that you actually believe that stealing a little bit isn't a problem and you believe that lying on occasion isn't a problem. That's a belief. And, uh, but when you look at the result, when you really meditate and you really begin to train your mind, you see actually there are consequences to this, to my happiness. But coming back to the dana and how dana supports sila, this capacity to let go, not hang on to everything that you have, to give away a portion of it and to train yourself to do that, then it's also possible that helps us to restrain the desire mind. Giving away some of your wealth, some of the things that you like, then when the desire comes up, I really want to do this, but it's against the precept. Having trained in dana, it's possible to give up the desire. You see how that that training in relinquishing then can be, you can act on it on a mental level. I've been giving away a portion of my income. I've been giving food in Thailand. They give food to the monks every day. And if that's the kind of training that a person's been going through, committing to, training with, when a desire comes up which is unskillful, there is this capacity to give it away, put it down. And... Uh, Similarly, as I was saying, with the mindset, you come and meditate, the hindrances that are often oppressing the mind, training and putting things down, recognizing hindrance and putting it down, not picking it up, not grasping, not hanging on to it. So these things, they overlap and they support each other. In general, you can separate dana, sila and bhavana, but right there when you're sitting, you're practicing relinquishing, you're practicing giving away, you're practicing giving up. When you do your meditation, and it's a very profoundly important to your meditation practice that you know how to give things up, how to let things go, how to put things down. Then with the sila, sila is, sounds basic at first, five basic rules, but the more you practice not to harm, panatipata veramani, I refrain from killing any living creature. What this does is it, it puts, I was talking about this earlier with another group, there, there becomes a kind of an obstacle towards doing what you used to do. So it might be the cockroaches, uh, the ants, the mosquitoes, whatever. Or you might have maybe used to go fishing or whatever, but you're committing to a standard, an ethical standard, and the desire to kill comes up, and something comes up, and it's like, well, you can do it, but if you do it, it's against the precepts. And if we don't do it, it's making karma in your mind with a higher level of conscience. You're not doing it because other beings wish to live and it's training yourself to be more sensitive and more conscientious towards other beings. So in just this act of refraining from killing, you're developing a very important quality of sensitivity and you're developing kindness. You're developing the opposite to harmfulness. You're developing kindness. So the sila is obviously supporting us in a process of developing our minds. Similarly with truthfulness, it starts with not telling the gross lies. It starts with trying to restrain ourselves from harsh speech. When we do that, we're about to say something that's not entirely truthful. Sometimes in the beginning we say it, but then we have to be honest. Eventually we have to say, oh, that was a lie. I'll retake my precepts. That was a lie. And so 
when Lord Buddha laid down this this paradigm or this system or this container for us to decide to live within, this is an enormous gift that he gave us. At the beginning, we think it's oppressive. We think it's something that we have to live in which is going to be a bit painful. We can't be as relaxed or we can't have as much fun as we used to. But what happens is you're training yourself to be a lovely being or a beautiful being. So you have deluded beings, that's called a patujana, and you have enlightened beings, that's called an aryajana. But there's something in between. Tanajana Nan talks about this often. It's called the kalyana chon, kalyana chana. That's the lovely being, the kind of being that uh, you would call your kalyana mitta. So when you train in, in ethical precepts and you're training in maintaining lovely qualities and refraining from acting out of the unlovely, the unbeautiful, then you, you do become a more beautiful person in terms of qualities, in terms of mental qualities. So the sila is actually enabling your inner goodness, which is beautiful, to shine through. So having been born as a human being, the inner goodness is there. It's a requisite, the merit to be born in the human form. There's a certain amount of inner goodness. When you commit to those precepts, that inner goodness is able to shine. And so it starts as an ethical training, which is external. And what it becomes is virtue, which is a quality, which is in your heart. And so there are many benefits to this, because the virtuous, as the Buddha explains, are loved by the devas and protected by devas. So everybody would like to have a sense that the devas would keep an eye on them and uh, in a dangerous world. And many of us do have kind of intuitions when we're going in dangerous places. Be careful. Be careful with that person. Be careful what you say here. Be, develop a kind of an intuition about staying safe. So there's many benefits, obvious benefits, but more and more subtle benefits. But probably one of the most profound benefits of what I was talking about for your pavana, for your citta bhavana, is that increased in sensitivity to how you affect others. And that makes you more sensitive to how you affect yourself, in a manner of speaking. You become aware of the way your mind is if you indulge unskillful mind states. And you become aware of how your mind is when you cultivate beautiful mind states. And then in this area of truthfulness, so you restrain the habit of telling lies. You just don't do it anymore. And then, so this is fundamentally important. This is going against this delusion. We've got our greed, we've got our hatred and our delusion. Delusion is seeing things incorrectly. Delusion is not seeing things in accordance with the truth. So when you make a commitment to being truthful, you start to notice what isn't in accordance with truth. You start to recognize your own delusions. In the past I thought this, or you might find yourself thinking something which is deluded, and you suddenly realize that's not true. It's not true that all Indonesians are handbag snatchers. You know, we can have this kind of tendency to have stereotypical views about things. It's not true that all immigrants are bad. It's not true that, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the stereotype is. We do become more sensitive, we become more reflective, we have more nuance in the way we perceive things. And, and you begin to learn to take each situation and each person and each occasion with more awareness and with more sensitivity and that you apply that to your own mind. What's the mind state like now? What's it like now? And this capacity to be honest with yourself because a lot of our delusions, if we have an attachment, we're deludedly attached to something because we like it, so we have a habit of justifying it. It's a very deep habit in human beings. You will have some kind of story about why it's okay, why drinking is okay, why extramarital sex is okay, why stealing from the government is okay. You have a, a belief or a story and when you keep these precepts, you suddenly realize, well, a lie is a lie. And if I act on this, I might be able to justify it, but at the very least, I have to acknowledge that I'm not being truthful. And this goes deeper and deeper. It's important to understand that if you want to realize truth, if you want to realize the ultimate truth, you don't want to make any karma with deceit. If you 
and it, for you to be sitting in this room and listening to wise reflections from someone who contemplates truth and having monks visiting and, and your general interest in studying suttas and you know you have an interest in the truth you must have been very truthful for a long time actually that's kind of a tendency that you have but we can all degenerate and our truthfulness can always be refined and developed so whenever this comes up in terms of your training talking about sealer again now the, especially around speech when the, the possibility to tell a lie comes up even if you can justify it we have to be honest with ourselves okay I'm making karma with deceit I'm making karma with untruthfulness and just to be aware if you do it it's very very likely that someone will come and deceive you it's very likely that people will tell lies to you so that's something we have to be aware of and then as Lord Buddha explained that his Dhamma will not disappear overnight he said it will actually change it will be called the same thing but the teachings the way they're presented will change so that in the end it will be unrecognizable it was not the Dharma of the Buddha so what that means is there's more and more deluded teachings teaching false Dhammas so if we make karma with falsity with deception we increase our chances of meeting teachers who will teach us incorrectly this is very dangerous so this is another reason why we wholeheartedly embrace truthfulness because we want to realize the truth we want to meet teachers who are going to teach us about how to contemplate the truth how to weaken delusion how to develop wisdom how to live our life in accordance with truth so that we can realize the truth we don't want to make any karma with deceiving people so that someone comes and deceives us and derails us from our goal so it's very important and then on the inner level being honest about what's a deluded mind state you have to say that's not true or that's not honest and that's not don't believe that and uh, refer to the standards of the wise about what is honest what is truthful what is a wisdom teaching what is a wise attitude or what is a wise standards for how we live our lives so this whole area of, of uh, ethical restraint developing a heightened sensitivity to how we affect others and how we affect our own minds and developing a sense of conscience through the training in, in sila we apply those qualities the sensitivity the conscience and the love of truth and then what's happening is the mind is becoming more clear it recognizes truth more clearly so when you come to try to develop your insight this is very important that you have a mind which is clear and still enough to be able to recognize the truth because that's what insight is insight is when you see things as they are delusion has to fall away and then you see things as they really are so this truthfulness becomes an internal quality it's actually sati and panya or sati and sampajanya sampajanya is seeing things in the context of the truth right view understanding things correctly in terms of worldly conventions and then ultimately in terms of really seeing no a thought just is a thought I'm not right it's not a self and a series of thoughts is a sankhara it's a formation and it becomes a, a sense of self and the sense of self is actually an opinion it's an idea it's a habitual view but it's not the truth but if you've trained yourself to be truthful enough and attentive enough and pure enough and still enough what you will see is a thought is a thought ah and a feeling is a feeling and that tendency to grasp at it deludedly as being mine is weaker and weaker and weaker and you just see more truthfully thoughts are thoughts feelings are feelings bodies are just bodies my thought is no more special than another person's thought my opinion is no more important than another person's opinion so that tendency towards being contentious I'm right I know more I'm more special I'm going to prove it to you all of that can drop away what a relief be truthful be clear be still a thought is just a thought a feeling is just a feeling a body is just a body mindfully aware of things as they arise and pass away and then this mind that can see things clearly 
develops deeper and deeper insight and the deeper and deeper insight cuts through that delusion and then the ignorance evaporates. Ignorance is not knowing and because we don't know in accordance with the truth, we're deluded. When we chip away at that delusion and we see things more and more clearly, when we're really seeing things clearly, the ignorance is also evaporated, it's gone. It's like a dark room, you turn on the light, with this really, really clear knowing of the truth as it is, you turn on the light and the darkness of not knowing is gone. So just talking a little bit about how we train in dharma for worldly benefit, but also for learning how to relinquish desires. That's a craving for pleasant feelings, but also our aversions. We can let go of our aversions, our reactions. The dana is training that. And then training in the sila to support the process of cultivating the qualities that weaken greed, hatred and delusion and support truth discerning awareness in the mind. Another really important thing to mention about dana is when you give, basically you're helping people. In samsara we've all made good karma and we've all made bad karma, unfortunately. At times we all need help. So the direct implication of being generous is that when you need help, someone will help you. But if we're a bit stingy and we don't give, and if we, on top of that, if we actually steal, sometimes when we need help, no one helps. And that adds to the experience of pain and difficulty and loss. There's also the pain of that feeling of I need help and no one's helping. So we're all going to have some obstacles, we're all going to have some challenge, and we're all going to need help. And so uh, you're already embracing your practice of dana beautifully. That's one of the main reasons Ajahn Pava and I came, was to rejoice in that, and Anamodana, and just say, that's wonderful, keep going. But in terms of what I could give you, I hope, is to help you to understand where your practice of dana will go, how to refine it, how to use it to train yourself in the sila and encourage you to keep your sila as impeccably as you can, understanding that the sila is it's a process, it's stewarding a process of developing the inner qualities that will allow you to perceive the ultimate truth as it is and destroy delusion and let go of ignorance. So uh, in answer to Sui An's question now, now I bring out the big guns hopefully having inspired you to practice, now I, now I tell you how to do it, what, what I would hope you would do. Because you're Asian Buddhists and because you have faith, I would really recommend some chanting, because most people enjoy it anyway. So that might be Pali, or it might be mantra, Sanskrit mantras, or it might be uh, a Chinese uh, puja to Kuan Yin or Amitabha or Siddhikabha or whatever. Whatever the the Buddhist chanting that you enjoy. It's really good to do chanting before meditation because it's recollecting Buddha, Dharma and Sangha and in doing that you're taking the mind off other objects and placing them on the objects of refuge. So it's already dropping worldly concerns and it's bringing up a recollection Buddha Nusati, Dhamma Nusati, Sangha Nusati and then so the mind's already brightening and the mind's already collecting so it's much easier in general to sit meditation after a session of chanting because the mind's already becoming wholesome, it's already letting go of its discursive thoughts because you're having to concentrate on the chanting. So we do some chanting, 10, 15, 20 minutes. If you really like chanting, do half an hour, an hour, it's okay. But then I think really important to sit for... If you've hardly ever sat before, okay, start with 15 minutes. But if you do have some experience with sitting, uh, half an hour to 40 minutes, I would say, is, is the minimum if you can, you know, to sustain. So if you can do an hour once or twice a week, no problem, but you can only do 40 minutes a day every day, I would definitely say do the 40 minutes a day every day. And uh, But if you haven't really committed to that yet, okay, 15 minutes, maybe 5 to 10 minutes of chanting and 15 minutes of sitting. So mindfulness... We all have some, it's usually fuzzy and clouded. Delusion is affecting it, penetrating it, 
overclouding it. So what we do in meditation is we're specifically, intentionally cultivating more clarity in the mindfulness, generating clarity, clear mindfulness. So this is what we need to do. This is a, our antidote to delusion and to fuzziness, cloudedness, confusion is clarity. We need to generate it. So if we don't do the chanting first, you might find you just don't want to sit because you don't want to sit with the mind that just thinks so much is painful. So if you do the chanting first, you'll find that there will usually be less thinking. But it's also important to understand that for modern people, there will be thinking. So don't think it's wrong when you come to meditate and there's thinking. What I'd like to encourage you is to not be averse to the thinking. When you come to the sitting cushion, you know there's going to be some thinking. Just accept that there's going to be some thinking. Don't get contentious with it. But also understand that if you really sit on that mat for half an hour, the thinking will get less. Just give it some time. It's not an app that you can download. You can't press the peaceful mind function. It's an organism. It's organic. It's, it's not a computer. So it's just like growing a plant. If it's a small and delicate plant, you have to pour the water. It needs a certain amount of sunlight. It needs some fertilizer. If it's a really coldy, frosty day, it might need to be brought inside. You know, minds are like that. They're sensitive. And in terms of generating sensitive qualities it takes particular care and it takes discipline so it's like if you don't water it if you don't fertilize it if you leave it out in the frost if it's a new shoot it doesn't grow it shrivels so consistent practice is important but what happens is a few moments of peacefulness if you keep meditating every day become a few minutes of peacefulness a few minutes of peacefulness becomes five to ten minutes of peacefulness just from the consistency of the practice and at the very least from being patient with thoughts not trying not to believe them coming back to the breath keep starting again at the very least and this is not a this is not a small thing at the very least you become less identified with your thoughts and that is a huge gift because if you believe your thoughts you're going to suffer a lot if you always have to be right if you always have to prove to others that your perspective is the right one. If you can't let go of your grudge because they haven't said sorry and they should say sorry, this is very painful. But if you can, and that's the situation for most people, if they can't just see a thought as a thought, a feeling as a feeling, a reaction as a reaction. So if you have a long-term view, even if your meditation is sitting there with thinking, as long as you're establishing a bit more sense of space from the thoughts, it's very, very valuable because in the middle of the day, you're having a reaction or you're really, really worried about something and you suddenly have the kind of insight, oh, it's just a thought, these are thoughts, I'm, I'm thinking too much, don't think so much. And you can get a little bit of space in your waking hours from your thoughts. And this actually means you will suffer much less. So be willing to sit with a mind that thinks and just keep trying gently, firmly but gently. Don't follow the thoughts, just come back. You can think after the meditation, just say, come back after the meditation. If you get lost for five minutes, you suddenly realize, okay, start again. But at least you're putting on the brake sometime. At least you're putting in a thin end of a wedge in sometime. You are cultivating a capacity to disassociate from and separate from and see thoughts as thoughts. That's fundamentally important. And it deepens. It gets the space around thoughts. If you keep practicing, there's more and more space around thoughts. A thought really is just a thought. And it might be skillful, and if you share that thought with others, it might be helpful. It's not that thoughts aren't useful if they're skillful thoughts, wholesome thoughts, wise thoughts. But you still understand them as just thoughts. And uh, so, please meditate. In general, I like to tell people to do it in the morning because you've already rested, you haven't got busy, and there's much less likely to be a lot of thinking. So in get up in the morning if you can, and... Uh, do your chanting, or wash your face, brush your teeth, uh, have some hot water, go and do your puja and then see it. You'll probably find that there's much less thinking. And then you'll find that the clarity that you generate in the morning, you can take into your day with you, some of it. But if you leave it to the end of the day, you'll be struggling with a lot of nodding in general because the mind's exhausted and it didn't have clarity, it wasn't able to separate from its thoughts, it wasn't able to separate from its moods, it got lost in them, and it, restlessness, it acted out the restlessness, so at the end of the day, it's tired, 
and you come to meditate and the mind just wants to sleep, it is tired. So meditating in the morning is better. And if you, probably what happens for people who are sincerely interested in peacefulness, what usually happens is if you can commit to meditating in the morning, you'll probably find that before you go to bed you want to meditate again. Because it's really good stuff, you know, it's really useful, it's a gift to yourself, you see the benefits. So if you can establish that meditating in the morning habit, you might begin to notice the other periods of the day where you really could meditate if you, if you chose to. Turn off the, the phone, put it on silent, or go into another room that you specifically use for meditation. But in terms of having been born or having been in a place where you're Buddhist and you have the opportunity to practice, for me, for me, not practicing is just not an option. I, whenever I meet Buddhist lay people who haven't yet begun their meditation practice, all I can say is why. But I do notice that a lot of people think it's an option. And all I can say is, that's crazy. Because you've met the most precious jewel. And it's fundamentally important to your own well-being. If you don't clarify your mindfulness and weaken your delusion, you're going to make really big mistakes. You're going to end up with a lot of suffering. You're going to end up somewhere where you don't want to be. That's a fact. So, all we can say really is, wake up. You're living in a place which is a very, very dangerous and uh, getting more dangerous. So, while you have the opportunity to practice, please, that's a gift to you. It doesn't matter that much to me if you don't, but because you've been helping us in the monastery, uh, I want to come and try to help you. So, what I can say is, don't let your opportunity slip you by. And you've got people explaining wisdom teachings. You've got uh, people who meditate a lot coming to visit you. You've got centers and you've got people leading retreats. So, uh, recognizing you're in a dangerous situation and recognizing that you have an incredible good fortune and that you, the methods are right in front of you now, the teachers are right in front of you now, that you have the merit to have met the Buddhist lineage, then uh, please embrace it. And uh, if it seems really, really hard, commit to 10 minutes a day. But it's more like you just have to commit to it. It has to be an absolute commitment. Okay, it seems really, really hard, but I'll commit to 10 minutes a day. If you can commit to 10 minutes a day, this is for the beginners, then after a month or two, you can go to 15. After six months, you'll be able to do half an hour. But it comes from that daily commitment. If you never make the commitment, you're going to die without practicing. And you don't know where you're going to be born. So it's time to make the commitment. For those who do half an hour but really could do more, it's time for you to increase your commitment. So often for people who've developed some skills in meditation, the mind gets a little bit peaceful and it's like, okay, that's enough, go and do the next thing. And it's like, well, no. You're doing the most important thing, the most precious thing, the most valuable thing, and you don't know if you'll have the opportunity to do it in future lives, but you have the opportunity to do it in this life. So for those of you who've been doing half an hour a day for the last 10 years, I really think it's time to make it an hour a day. And if you've been doing an hour a day for the last five years, okay, an hour in the morning and an hour at night. Because minds get purified through practice. Listening to Dharma is very helpful, contemplating Dharma is very helpful, and often we do it in our meditation as well. But the Dharma Vichaya, the contemplation of Dharma, is one factor of the seven factors of enlightenment. Concentration is another. Mindfulness is another. So you also have to clarify your mindfulness and you have to develop your samadhi. And that's what makes it possible to have the three types of wisdom. There's a wisdom that comes from listening and there's a wisdom that comes from contemplation, which is wisdom, but it's not the type of wisdom that will destroy delusion and liberate you. There's the wisdom that comes from bhavana, which is at a deeper level. So the studying and the contemplating, the dana and the sila, this ripens the mind, but it's only through a lot of practice that you see clearly the truth as it is on a very deep level in a way that destroys ignorance. And until you've done that, until we've done that, ignorance is going to be dragging us by the neck around in samsara from the heavens to the hells. There's no choice. 
you can't avoid rebirth if you haven't destroyed delusion. So it's very, the implication of not practicing is, is really dire, it's really scary, and the implications of practicing are good, good for you, good for others, so there's no choice really. I'll probably end there. But, uh, if I'm a little bit fierce in moments, that's because I care for you. May we all grow in Dhamma. Anybody want to ask any questions? Well, it's absolutely clear. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to ask any questions, so I'm going to ask you. Did anybody disagree with anything that I said? I, I humbly humbly allow you to tell me thoughts are just thoughts and not agreeing is okay. Sometimes every now and then I've, I'm of the character of greed type, that's my latent tendency, so I like beautiful things. And uh, every now and then I encourage myself to give up my favorite thing. And I've done this a good number of times this lifetime. And uh, I think it's very important. we are seeing that tendency that I have to like beautiful things and the way that it can manifest in the mind is every now and then I, I give away the thing I like most. And it always hurts a little bit. And afterwards there's this lovely sense of, oh, oh wow, that's really nice when you can give away <laughs> what you like most. I had this beautiful Amitabha Buddha, one solid piece of amber, golden yellow color. And if you put a candle behind it, it's like this floating golden nimitta of a Buddha. So beautiful. And uh, I gave that to the Dalai Lama. And I haven't had any remorse about it. And I had... Although it's interesting because you give things away and we also we know that things will come back on one level. So I had a, a small Buddha which was carved from Bodhi tree wood from the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya. I was there practicing about seven years ago and one monk who lives there six months a year gave me uh, this, uh, actually gave it to a friend and she gave it to me. I can't even remember who I gave it to now. I know it was a monk that I respected a lot. I think it was the Kamapa. I gave it to the Kamapa when I saw him. Then I was back in Bodh Gaya and I remember thinking it was really nice having that little... For a long time I didn't think about it but then you're back in the Bodhi tree and a little bit of greed comes back and there's a sense of... It's really, I really liked that that Bodhi tree wood Buddha. I wonder if I could get another one. And I was like, well I gave one to the Karmapa. I mean there should be like hundreds coming. And what was really interesting was that was the time I was trying to do 300, 300 hours in five weeks or six weeks, whatever it was. And so an interesting thing happened. It was the second last day. And people were trying to talk to me. I was trying to avoid them because to get through eight and a half or nine hours a day is not much time for... You can't get distracted. And there's this one man that had been trying to meet me and I'd been trying to avoid him. And so he came to the, the place we were having lunch. He found out where we were having lunch and he came to the place where we were having lunch. He's a Thai artist that paints, quite elderly now, but he paints the murals, the devas and the things that he was painting at the Wat Thai. And um, so he came to the table and he says, yeah, I've been trying to have a meeting with you, trying to meet up with you because I've got something special I want to give you. And so he gave myself and Ajahn Pavro a, a Buddha card from Bodhi Tree Wood. So what one gives does come back. But just to make the point, because this is really interesting, the next day when we were at the airport, I already had my new Bodhi tree wood amulet. I was already content. I was very grateful. And, uh, but we were at the airport and I was sitting next to another monk and I was just having a chat with him. And then he pulled out of his bag this little purse. He used to live there for five years. And he was in, involved in building a monastery. And he pulled out another little Buddha carved from Bodhi tree wood. So that was two in two days. But it was the last two days. And uh, I think maybe the devas were like teaching me patience. But it's interesting, isn't it? What one gives, it comes back. 
giving many flowers. When you go to a Bodh Gaya and some people can't go, but they want you to make an offering for them. And a lot of these people don't have much money, so something I've done is give flowers on their behalf and dedicate merit. So I think maybe you know upwards of 10,000 flowers because one garland has 50 flowers at least. And so if you give three a day, that's 150. And if you, st- if you give it morning and evening and you stay for a month, it starts to be thousands and thousands of flowers. I remember I was in the monastery in its first year and I was dedicating the merit to those people, but obviously a, a portion of it is accruing to me as well because I'm making the offerings. I remember this woman turned up with her pickup truck was full of frangipani trees. I think she offered 50, 50 frangipani trees. I didn't even know her. So she drove into the monastery with 50 frangipani trees and she said, Ajahn, I have 300 more at home. She was growing them in a field. She said, and I'd like to offer all of them to you. I mean, that's a bit bizarre, isn't it? 350 frangipani trees. I actually said no. I said, we'll take 50 for now. 50 is probably enough for now. (laughs) We didn't have the person to plant them and monks can't dig. At that stage, we didn't have a gardener. But it's just interesting to see. I think, you know, Bodh Gaya is a very special place. So you're giving all these flowers. And then all of a sudden, it's possible to have 350 flowering shrubs without asking for them. So these things are very real. Karma, cause and effect. But what I was talking about, more than the, the good things that we can get back, it's nice to hear these stories because they're interesting and they're fun. And it gives us confidence in that on the material level there really will be a benefit. But that capacity to let go of kilesa and to let go of delusion is the real benefit that we, uh, that we can all experience if we're sincere there. I don't know if you noticed, but I've actually become a little bit more fierce than I was three years ago. <laughs> and I'm, I'm slightly surprised. Last night I was at SJBA and I was halfway through the talk I was thinking, I really want to tell some kind of charming anecdote. I really want to say something funny. Not to be liked, but just to see people smile. And it wouldn't come. It just would not come. There was no personal story that was going to come and there was no... It was no... That's what came. And I think what it's a response to is, I ask your permission to speak truthfully, is when I come to Malaysia, I see people who I believe have a great deal of merit stored up. And I get the sense that some of our opportunity is slipping through our hands. And I just want to say, guys, like make a big noise on the table like a teacher, you know, at school. (laughs) Pay attention. Don't forget to take the time to practice every day. I get the sense that people are doing more retreats and more pilgrimages, more trips to Thailand. That's really wonderful because if you do have a busy life, something that you can do is like schedule a chunk of it where you're just not going to be there. That's skillful. But overall, if you can do some practice every day, if you want to kind of add it up, the five-day retreat, the seven-day retreat, the ten-day retreat, two ten-day retreats, compared to one and a half hours a day, if you could do that, and just do a little bit of a calculation and you'll see that the daily practice at the end of your life is going to be a huge investment that you will derive dividends from.